Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming back again. I'm going to turn it over to Kriki Kazak to give us her Buffalo Commons introduction to this workshop, and then we'll dive right in. But it's great to see everyone. So now I scan all Kriki Kazak ni so onondawaga ni I'm Kriki Kazak. Um, I work on Buffalo Commons, which is the joint collaboration between Cornell ILR here in Buffalo and Partnership for the Public Good. I see a few new faces. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Buffalo Commons works on a few different things. Number one, it's our digital library, which you can navigate to on our website, um, all the way to the right hand side, Buffalo Commons Digital Library. And it offers, you know, over 400 different resources um, that are available to anyone about Buffalo or Western New York. So populations, challenges, opportunities that both Partnership with the Public Good compiles, Cornell, and a variety of our partners. So I encourage you to check it out there. Um, the other thing we do is connect a lot of our partners with researchers. Um, so if you or your organization has any questions um, that you need support in trying to find answers to, that's one of the things that we can often do is to match you with some of our researchers across the 21 institutions of higher ed here in Western New York who might be able to help answer some of those questions. The final thing is um, these workshops. So we have these workshops to cover two different things. Number one, skills. So these are uh, skill workshops that help support partners in figuring out, well, how do I do things like work with the media, um, whether it's written, whether it's like today's um, TV or interviews, uh, but we also do issue-based conversations too. So things like climate change, uh, but also transportation um, and education, preservation, um, I know we've had lots of different conversations with our partners, um, and we very much encourage you all to talk to each other. Oftentimes when we're in a room like this, um, we can make those connections with each other and able to support each other's campaigns. Um, so if you have any ideas for workshops or skills that you or your organization are interested in, I highly recommend that you reach out to us, um, and we might be able to present one of those workshops um, in this hybrid fashion. So with that, I'll pass it back to Andrea. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks so much. So I'm Andrea O'Sullivan, director here at Partnership for the Public Good. Um, and as most of you know, we are a community-based think tank and a network of about 325 community organizations. And we support those partners throughout the year with action research, uh, civic engagement, and policy development toward our collective policy agenda called the Community Agenda and on a range of other uh, justice, equity, and sustainability issues. So we are here today for our third and final installment of this edition of Working with the Media. Um, this is a new one for us, focusing on doing really well at TV and radio interviews. Um, and we're so happy to have with us Jay Moran from WBFO and Charlie Specht, an investigative reporter at the Buffalo News, um, but who had a years at Channel 7, so lots of TV experience as well. Um, and we are first going to pass the mic around so you can each introduce yourselves, um, just who you are. Uh, if you are with a PPG partner organization, tell us who that is that you're here with today. Um, and then we will ask Charlie and Jay to just give a brief introduction about themselves and their journalism work as well. Um, then we are going to hear from these two, a range of tips and advice. What should you do before, during, after a TV and radio interview? I know for me, um, I would say TV interviews are the most stressful part of all the media work that we do radio. I feel okay. These days you can have your notes. You can be staring at your screen and be rude to the radio interviewer across from you, but on camera is a whole different thing. So we'll talk through all that. Um, and then have plenty of time for your questions and discussion. And then we're going to have an opportunity to practice, which I hope that some people will take us up on. Um, but let's just go around for Sarah Jablonski. I'm with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Erie County. I believe we are a partner and my office is right over there. I work in 4-H youth development. Good afternoon, everyone. Seamus Gallivan talking with my mouth full. Don't do that in media interviews. I'm with PPG member Slow Roll Buffalo. Steve Thorne. I'm from the Jung Center Buffalo. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Vicki Kearns, and I'm a volunteer with the Young Center doing some promotion. I do have experience as a reporter, so I've got all ears for what you're doing today. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Rose. I'm a public health and social work student, and I'm an intern for the Partnership for Public Good. 
I'm Stephen Hogsma. I'm with Housing Opportunities Made Equal. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Wooten. I'm the Director of Community Research here at PPG, and I do have to jump out at once, so I apologize for that, but glad to be here. My name is Nathan, and I'm unaffiliated. Kathy Creighton, I'm the Director of the Buffalo Collab for Cornell. Hi, I'm Mara Coven gelman I'm the Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council. I'm Ben Rosick. I'm the Communications Coordinator at Preservation Buffalo Niagara. I'm Munay Reglero. I work with PPG as a arts organizer. Uh, today I'm going to do a couple of pictures. Uh, this is just for the archive of PPG. And I don't know if they are going to publish it, but if somebody has some problem with that, you just can tell me. It's going to be just a couple of pictures. Okay. Hi, I'm Char. Um, there are not yet. Yeah. We actually do because we we with your permission we also record this and a lot of partners request it who couldn't make it so they'll listen to the presentation after. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love to not talk into the mic. That'll be <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Charlie Specht. Um, I'm a reporter at the Buffalo News, and um, I, I started my journalism uh, career at the News uh, about 10 years ago, and I worked there for a couple of years and then went into TV where I worked at uh, Channel 7 uh, for five years and um, just doing investigative reporting, uh, did a lot of stories about the Diocese of Buffalo, um, and then I've been back. I decided to go back into uh, into print or digital, whatever you want to call it. And I've been back for about a year, kind of doing the same uh, type of work. Um, and yeah, I'm just happy to be here. I'm not. I'm by no means an expert on this sort of thing, uh, but uh, there are some general, you know, rules and tips that you sort of have in the TV world, and I'm happy to, you know, let you in on some of these secrets or mysteries or whatever and um because i think ultimately if you're able to talk you know more comfortably and then it makes for a better interview uh and you get people to open up and it ends up being you know better for the public uh to know uh, what you're all about so uh, my name's Jay Moran. I'm at WBFO. I've been there for about 15 years hosting uh, Morning Edition. Um, before that, I was in a variety of different capacities in broadcasting, mostly in almost all in radio, from being a disc jockey to being a sportscaster to, well, just about everything, like I said. Um, and recently, we started a, a show called Buffalo What's Next at uh, WBFO that uh, seems to have a certain uh, resonance uh, in the city right now that's been a real interesting part of what I've been able to do. And um, probably a lot of what I'll share today is pretty much based on that experience in the last few months. That's great. And that show has hosted quite a few of our partners and lots of residents and community advocates. And I really recommend it. And I'm sure that's given you an insight into what it's like to sit down and interview folks who maybe are not talking to the media very often. Um, so yeah, to, to their points, I think our goal for today is really to share um, tips so that our partners and residents who want to weigh in on on important local issues have better luck getting their interviews included, getting quoted in these stories. Um, we have covered in the last workshops, which folks are welcome to get the recording or these resources are on our website too, on our work with the media page. Um, we've covered how to hold a press conference, how to write opinion pieces, so very much how to generate your own media coverage for your issue. Um, so let us dig in. Let us say that one of these partners has sent out an announcement, something important. They've managed to get an interview with a TV or radio reporter. What should they clarify before that uh, interview happens? Yeah, so um, it kind of depends on the situation. Uh, probably what they're going to do is ask to meet you somewhere to do the interview. Um, 
generally speaking, I know that we like to like be in our office and stuff when we're, when we're interviewed, but generally speaking for TV, um, the pictures matter. So they're going to try to, they're going to not want you in just sort of a boring nondescript office. Um, the best thing is, uh, you know, they want to do the interview with you and then take what we call B-roll, which is like when you see an interview with somebody, you don't just see their face for like two minutes straight. You see, you know, maybe a 10 or 20 second um, clip of the person's face and then it'll cut to a video of something else of them doing something, you know. Um, so th they're going to want to get you sort of in your natural habitat doing whatever it is you do. Um, to get video of that. Um, and it, if there is no really great video to get, like if it is just sort of like an office, um, they ask you to come outside, like and do it on the street, just because to have like the cityscape behind you is just more visually interesting than, um, you know, that, than just a blank wall. Um, so it, it's also um, important to find out like um, the best case scenario would be like if there's a reporter working on the story and said, well, we're going to story about this and I'd like to interview you. Um, if, if a TV station assigns a reporter to it, then, then typically um, you're going to get like the standard story on TV is uh, like a minute and a half, um, which is not a lot of time. <laughs> um, but there's also uh, things called Vosats. Does anyone know what a Vosat is? So picture you're watching the six o'clock news and like the anchor introduces something, you know, a partnership for the public good it had this program and, and here's what they said. And then it, it will cut straight to say Andrea and she would give like a sound bite, right. And then it would go back to the anchor. So there's, and then they would do like a, um, like an outro, like, they would say, you know, the 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 event is next week. That's different from like a story where a store a full story is a full package. We call it would be like a minute and a half long, whereas that might only be thirty seconds. So, um, it, a, a vosat. It's just yeah, it's just TV jargon. It has to do with it, it's actually it's um, voice over and then sat is shot on tape. So it's a it's a someone talking and then the sound bite basically. So I would recommend trying to find out like, is it going to be a full story or are you just looking for like kind of a sound because that's going to determine like how you talk kind of, because you're, you're not going to be able to get into all sorts of depth mm -hmm. uh, necessarily. Um, talking in, you know, one of the, one of the great things about TV as opposed to let's say like newspapers is that um the person gets a, a sense of like your enthusiasm and like, you know, if you're really excited or interested about something and uh, the TV camera is like a great, like disinfectant kind of like people will either like you or they won't like you <laughs> and different people may like you and not, you know, it's just, it's like just meeting someone. It's, there's something about it. Um, whereas reading it, you know, like in the, in the newspaper or online is different. You, you're thinking about it, but you're not really getting like the, you know, passion of the person. So I think that's, it's important to kind of um, be aware of that and not just to sort of monotone talk about something like if, if you don't look interested, um, then the viewer is not going to be interested. Um, but you also want to be authentic. You don't want to come off like a circus act, like, you know, you're just really you know, exaggerating or something, because that's going to look strange also. But um, the hardest thing for me when I start when I first went into TV was you do kind of have to like project. Mm. So I tend to speak softly and mumble. Um, and so like when I'm on when I was like on TV, like I would have to like talk really loud and like force myself to talk loud um, and slow down also, uh, because when you're nervous, I tend to talk mm. fast. Most people tend to speed up. Um, and you want to give people, uh, you know, a minute for your message to, to sink in. So. That's great. So a couple of basics, I think, when you're invited for an interview, first is like, is it live or not, I think is important. Um, and then I think we'll talk a lot more about what you started, which is so important, which is like presentation style during interviews as well. 
Well, actually, um, what you just said about live or taped is key critical uh, for what we do. And, and it'll be, I think, I've have to, I've kind of had to turn myself around here and think about what it's like from your perspective, but that is a big part of it is, is just that if it's, if it's live, you know, depending on how long it is, it's another key part of it. Length always try to always ask that. How long is this segment going to be? Is it going to be four minutes? Is it going to be 20 minutes? Whatever the case may be. Um, but with that, if it is taped, it's probably going to face editing of, of a certain regard. If it's live, you're going to probably have an opportunity to you know, express yourself a little bit further. Again, if it's longer than say four minutes. So there's, those are, I would, I would say if there are just some, a, a couple of things, you know, is it live or is it taped and the length of the segment. And then to that point, um, if partners really have a point they want to get across to this question of live and editing, I've often wondered myself in TV and radio interviews, is it okay? Or does it kind of add to the work on your end? Say you really have your main message of your advocacy campaign. You say it, it has not come out well. Can you say to the reporter, actually, can we stop? And I'd like to say that again. And that might vary from TV to radio. Cause I know sometimes radio, you're kind of recording the full four or six minute piece. And maybe it's annoying to go back and edit. Whereas TV, you're just pulling. Yeah. On, t- clips. on TV, you can absolutely do that. It's rare that you're going to be doing a live interview on TV. It's, um, and, and you'll know if you are like, yeah. <laughs> like you watch like the morning shows, that's where it's common. Where like you do what's called a hit where anchor will go in, you know, to the reporter and say, they're live at the Erie County fair with so-and-so and, you know, like you'll, you'll know they'll be ready and telling you the majority of, of interviews are going to be taped. Um, t- I guess taped is not the re- recorded. Um, and so y- you can always say it, you can always say it over and um, because a lot of times it's not even the person that's necessarily video uh, taping it, that is going to be choosing the sound bite. Uh, so like, uh, if a reporter is not sent, sometimes they'll just say, we'll go to a photographer, go and get a sound bite. And the photographer will go get that, you know, a couple of minutes of video, he'll upload it back at the TV station. And then a producer for that show will go through and say, I need a sound bite. I need a 10 second sound bite. I need a 15 second sound bite. And then they'll just pick what they think is the best. So, and that raw interview is not, is not going to go anywhere except on the server at the TV station. So you can always, if you feel like, even if you don't like mess up hugely, you can always say, can I say that again? Um, and that's totally normal. People do that all the time. And I think when I, some people, like a lot of people assume that it's live. And I think that adds a lot of anxiety to people when they're like, holy cow, I'm, you know, I'm going to be on live TV and clarifying that I think can put you at ease that it's not like this high stakes, you you know, like 60 minutes type <laughs> you know, thing. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. And um, what about you, Jay? It might be different for radio taping. Uh, Generally speaking, I would say uh, I don't really care for that idea of, of going back. Um, That being stated though, you know, if the mic's on and you're, you've got your, you're on, just repeat, you know, just go back to it. You know, I want to clarify that. I I mean, that's fine. You know, I, I, rather than say, can I go back and record that? I think that's a slight uh, variation, um, but it, I, I think that's, again, I'm asking you, if I ask you a question and then you kind of follow up with your original point and then I ask you question number two, you may want to just restate it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's very good. And it depends on the speaker too. I mean, if you're interviewing like the mayor and he's like, sorry, I lied about that. Let me say something <laughs> else. Or, or like, I messed up about that. Like, like you're, you're a public official. You're used to talking on camera you're not going to necessarily get a second chance, but if it's somebody that like, you know, is trying to just like a nonprofit or something, someone who's not necessarily on TV every day, then yeah, that's going to be more acceptable. Get a second chance here, friends. That's nice. Um, Very good. And then just to unpack a little bit, the point of asking how long it will be in each of these for our perspective as advocates and, and, community folks uh, is for me is about, first of all, how much preparation am I going to put into this? Because if they are just looking for 
two sentences, that's a lot easier. And I don't have to dig as deep to prepare for that. Um, but also, of course, the point is crafting your message and getting your main point across. Um, if it's going to be that short, obviously, you can really focus on the tagline for your campaign. What is the policy change? What is the building you're trying to preserve? Right? What is the main thing you want to get across? And then if it's going to be longer, you're going to want to anticipate a lot of the questions you're going to be asked. How much will it cost to preserve that building? How? What's the history of it? All these things. Um, and Buffalo, what's next is a wonderful opportunity because it's 25, 30 minute segments. So you can, on the, on the one hand, you get a lot in. On the other hand, you have to be pretty prepared because that's a lot of, of questions to answer. Um, so for me, that's always a critical one is how long, um, how long will it be? To, to close, I know some of you in here have done interviews. Any questions of things that like surprised you when you got there or that you wish you had asked um, in advance of an interview? I'm trying to remember that for myself too. Probably I was thinking. <laughs> thinking that I'd have questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks for doing this, guys. Um, question with a, a quick, quick turnaround. <laughs> um, so I've, I've, I've worked on their side of the media and I, uh, but I came into it through entertainment, human uh, interest, sort of storytelling. Um, and last year I worked with Charlie a lot, um, doing, uh, communications spokesperson for India Walton's mayoral campaign. And through that learned that in that process, the different, there's a difference, um, where for the first time, um, I was asking, the journalist okay what do you want to talk about and actually leading in to get to prepare for questions now back in the sort of human interest nonprofit entertainment realm i'm interviewing with scott scanlon tomorrow buffalo news different <laughs> sort of approach to a story is is it common even beyond the candidate political office realm is it is it okay for the interviewee to say in advance like to actually sort of dig deeper, ask a couple times, like, what do you want to talk about? And as part of that preparation, because I know that there, it, it already starts where Scott says, hey, I want to talk about and he gives a sort of vague overview that I can prepare with. But like how how um, I don't know, ethical is it uh, for for the interviewee to, to try to find out more and, and prepare better? Yeah, and I think an example from our work might be um, we get a call from a reporter We've seen the report on your website about segregation in Buffalo. And, you know, how much can we say, well, what do you want to focus on? Uh, seg the history, current segregation, food issues, school issues to really understand what we should be preparing. Um, I'm going to answer you, Seamus, with one of my favorite answers from all interviews. Great question. <laughs> Which <laughs> uh, it's interesting. I, ethical, I, I don't think that's an an issue of whatever an interviewee wants to tell me is, is, is fine. In the end, it's going to be up to me to, to decide what I'm going to ask and what I'm going to take and, and follow up on that with that though, is also the idea that I also want to know what your strengths are, what, you know, what's, you know, and if this is something that is a powerful part of what you're talking about, you know, I want to hear about it because now that gives me, something else to follow up on with maybe an opponent or just to dig a little bit deeper and really see if there's any depth to what this interview we wanted to talk about, you know, maybe they wanted to get a headline out there, but you know, maybe they don't really know what's underneath it. And, you know, you do find that occasionally. Yeah. I think it's okay just, you know, to do that kind of research as part of your preparation. The one thing that uh, some people ask was like a big no, no in journalism is sending questions ahead of time. Um, that's like, we don't like to do that because, um, then that gives like, especially if it's like a, a public office holder, then they get all of their handlers and PR people to sort of, you know, game plan the interview and it ends up being sort of not really authentic. Um, but I'll, um, I, I think it's okay to like, I'll give people topics, you know, what we're going to ask about like you said, housing segregation. And, and I saw this and can, you know, we're probably going to ask you about this as a reporter, you're always trying to sort of, it's tough because there's no reason for an interview. Like, like we're talking about here to be adversarial, but you're sort of always trying to get people off of the talking points as a reporter, because talking points are like boring. 
they're important but boring like they're great for like a report but you want like sort of a sort of a, not an emotional but a really authentic like you want to know why this person is really passionate about this issue and um, you want to get them to talk about it like sort of more on a human level um, and that will typically make your that will be your best soundbite if you go through the whole interview is when someone's really interested in something like let's say you, you use the example as a report on segregation um, you know giving a real specific human story about segregation and talking about what got you into this work and you know um you know specific stories like that's what you're going to be most passionate about as a speaker and that's what's going to come off best uh to a reporter so if you can kind of think ahead of time you know um why does the average person care about this and why why is it important um you know that buffalo is let's say segregated why is that bad you want to be able to to voice why that is and to put it in terms that like the average person is going to understand you got to keep in mind um people's attention spans are not great and they they tell us this as reporters and anchors like you're competing with not with like other stations you're competing with like breakfast your kids you know getting ready in the morning i mean people are coming in out of their bedroom and maybe you know look, looking at the tv or or even just looking at it on their phone today and um so you want to be you want to like get to the point and be you know uh be eloquent but you want to be sort of emphatic about whatever you're talking about because you are competing with all these other distractions that we have in our world today and one thing i'm curious charlie that i've often heard is like you should kind of always smile on tv even when you're talking about something really serious which is often the case for us um not necessarily smile but you shouldn't look super doomsday on your face and is that something that is said because i've been told that in previous organizational jobs like don't look super um sad and serious or i think as you said like the viewer won't connect with you but I then the know. issues that we talk about are often sad that, and serious. that might be like sexist or something because i've never saying that i've saying. never asked anybody to do that yeah. i've never okay. asked anybody to do that not that you went um, as a reporter but do you see that that's kind through? of odd to me I, I mean if you're talking about a you know a murder you don't want to be smiling yeah and about it i mean yeah. that would that would be unnatural right i mean that but it's okay in any case to have emotion coming through and when what you're talking about is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then as advocates here, we are often weighing, um, do we share personal stories as you just flagged? Do we use that time to share data and research? Maybe it depends on the story, but any thoughts on kind of which of those you, you tend to work into your stories more? Yeah, I, I would say both the time for uh, like the facts and data and research, if you can get that to the reporter, like as quickly, as early as possible. Um, I like using, so like the standard TV format is going to be a reporter saying a line, then a soundbite, then a reporter saying a line, a line then a soundbite. That's typically, I mean, it it does vary. Sometimes you put two sound bites in a row from two different people, but that's generally the formula. So I was like just putting facts in um, in for my line because then it's, you know, frankly, it's less work. You have to, you know, you don't have to worry about being cute and how you write it and thinking some, I'm just, that's not really my strength. So I, I like putting that, those kind of facts in. Um, but TV reporters today are so, and it's not just TV, but they're so crunch for time. Like I had the luxury when I was working at Channel 7 to, I had like a photographer with me um, and he would do the video and I'd ask the questions. Most TV reporters are doing everything themselves, setting up the camera, putting everything on. And, you know, so they have like, you would not believe this, but almost every night people are making their deadline to get on TV by like seconds. I mean, like it is just, it's, yeah, it, it's like minutes, sometimes seconds. So like when, if you do send a report with facts, you know, way before the interview even comes across, like they may be writing that in their script 
And then at 4.30, they're going to be putting in those sound bites. Um, it comes together quickly. So the more, I would say that like following up by email or even ahead of time giving, you know, that sort of thing, you guys publish it on your website. So the reports and stuff are there is helpful. And then when the interview happens, um, like stats aren't necessarily great for an interview unless they're sort of simple. Like the segregation thing, I did a story, you know, and the one stat I recall was 85% of people of color, I think live east of Main Street in Buffalo. Okay, yeah. Um, that's a stat that you could give in a sound in a sound bite because that's simple and it's like, wow, like holy cow. Um, I wouldn't necessarily list like seven different stats because that's going to get lost and the whole thing is not going to be put in. It's going to be chopped up. Um, and part of the chopping up is not because the TV people think that what you're saying is not interesting. It's I don't know how it developed, but it's basically people's attention spans. They won't like listen to a sound bite for more than like, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds at whatever the, um, you know, whatever the focus groups have decided. That's kind of why it's not, it's nothing personal. It's just kind of the way that the business works. And so should people to that point, should we be trying to speak in short sentences during, especially TV interviews to help that editing process? It helps. Um, it's not like a hard and fast rule. I would say maybe I always advise people to try to answer the question. Um, but, you know, people are just going to start talking and that's good. You want people to elaborate like for your first sentence, maybe you do answer in a short way and then expand on that. I, it would be weird for you to talk in only sound bites, like to say a sound bite and then <laughs> stop talking. I've actually had that before. There was a couple politicians who did that and it's extremely awkward and it comes off as very manufactured and sort of not authentic um so it's okay to, to and I, I do think reporters do want to know context and they want to know the backstory like because you that may not make it on tv but reporter may say oh that's interesting and file that away for another time or put that in their web story um so i i think you can kind of do both a little bit and um, I'll just say real quick, I love that point of sending your detailed materials ahead of time. A few times we've had TV stories where they like took our data and made a graphic on the screen. And we're always so like, that's great. They made a graphic with our stuff. But obviously that takes time. So you have to send it ahead. And I could even imagine like slow roll. If you send your schedule of rides, you know, that would be great to have on screen, but that will take them some time to just make a graphic with it, you know? So, yeah have something like a schedule or just like um, just hard information that you want them to use. Oh, I'm sorry. You have something like a schedule or some hard information. Sometimes you, you put the necessary information in a graphic when you send it to the media. You can, in the interest of their time, you, you can earn their favor by typing it out for them so they can just copy and paste it in into their story <laughs> i mean it's just a nice thing to do and they probably I, uh, they outwardly appreciate it often so be careful what you put in your in your graphics if it you know like if it's a pdf then then it's harder for them to pull that information and it, 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 this will change too like some of these things are basic principles but there tv goes through a lot of like fads with how news is presented like for a time at channel seven people that ran our company must have had must have paid an ungodly amount of money to a bunch of consultants who decided, wow, people really want and need to see a graph at the end of every story. And so this was pushed down on us. You've got, and we called it, I think we had a, a code where it was called in-depth. We'd be like, well, we need an, and then so the producer would say, well, we need an in-depth graphic. So you're sometimes, it fits obviously, and other times you're trying to come up with something. Um, and like that was, was the rule for like six months and then another consultant decided like that doesn't make any sense and then you try it so it does change so you gotta you it, it's good to like just communicate with the reporter like hey is there anything else i can give you you know because they may have some sort of mandate from their boss that they want you know extra data or you know it depends on the station too like whatever news director is running channel four 
may like things a certain way. The news director of Channel 7 maybe hates graphs and never uses graphs. So it's kind of, you can feel that out with people. And that's so interesting. Jay, it seems like a lot of WBFO interviews are at least a bit longer than these short TV clips. So any tips for what content to bring, stories, data, kind of to make the most of that time? It would be nice to get any type of information when it comes to stats and things like that in advance. That's that's great for sure. I mean, once we start talking, it's kind of hard to sift through all it. You know, nothing more better than just sit there and talking, trying to ask questions and listen and and look through through the information at the same time. Um, but uh, beyond that, I would just say, when you come, you know, be ready for. Uh, back to what I said before. How long, ask, how long do you, is this going to take? Because I think probably a lot of people here have dealt with our Mike Desmond over the years. And Mike is going, you know, his job was to come to in these meetings and get sound bites. You know, so he, and he was going to ask you whatever, and he loves to ask stumping questions and, or obscure questions. And it's just who he is and how he goes about getting his story. So yeah, you got to be ready for, for the way he goes about uh, doing things in that sense. So yeah, I guess you got to be ready for everything when uh, it comes to radio. It could be a little bit of everything. And then um, one quick, another question I have on this kind of content during the actual interview for both of you. Um, I guess, Charlie, for TV, any more tips, not only on speaking, but posture, how you stand. I mean, those, I've only had to do that once or twice, what you mentioned of like, let's have you walk through the office for B-roll. And that is the most awkward thing I've ever done. So any tips at all of like kind of appearing on camera um, and then Jay tips about again, speaking slowly, but other, other things that work or don't work for radio. Um, I was even thinking maybe I'm sure something that comes up a lot is we use so many acronyms in our work. We probably should not be using those in these interviews. So any, any stuff like that. I don't know, I'm pretty interested to hear about walking through, <laughs> tips on walking through the office. <laughs> um, but I'll just, I would just say when it comes to, to us, uh, tips, acronyms, I think it's all fine. But again, it comes to them. How much time do we have? You know, if I'm talking to you in the morning and we've got four minutes, you know, we got to be really careful about it. You know, we've, I've had people who come on and they'll just I'll ask them a, a kind of an open-ended question and two and a half minutes later, they're done. And that just really isn't going to make for an effective sound on the air. Um, so the, the timing factor is so important. If you, you know, if we say, yeah, we, we're going to be out for 25 minutes, well, sit back and, and give me what you have, you know, because I'm going to ask more questions. So it, it, it'll be fine. But I got to, I got to hear. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, good. Uh, how much prep are you and your your in the song interviews that you're doing? How much prep are you guys doing ahead of time? So for Zoom, how much prep does WBFO or the reporter side do ahead of time, especially on long interviews? Right. So in the, in this particular case, and that goes back to time, and I I did want to make this point. What's really helped, and like you mentioned earlier, we've had a certain amount of people come in who've had almost no media experience. They'll come in and they're, they're looking around and after we're done, was this live? I mean, it, it's it's interesting. There's how some of the folks aren't media savvy at all. And, and when it comes to radio, let's be honest, not a lot of people are listening to the radio like they were 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So there's just kind of a, an, an ignorance of the process when it comes to that. So back to that, how much I, I want you know, I'll, I'll do whatever kind of research. We've got the internet and that's great. And we can find out usually about everybody, something, but I really hope that and, and encourage people to get there as early as possible. So we can sit down and have a conversation beforehand. And that conversation, and again, it's, it's usually very casual, but I think it really goes a long way to establishing terminology and understanding of different things. If you've got an, if you've got an acronym, what is that? You know, what does that mean? It, it, because I think sometimes a lot of us think everybody knows our story already. And then we're just repeating it when it, in fact, it's not the case. It's, you know, we don't know the story. There's elements of, of what you do that we don't understand. And the sooner we can kind of sift that through before we go on the air, the better. So how much, how much time? I mean, if I have a guest on at uh, 10 o'clock, like I did yesterday, I think it was, or the day before I kind of like, they kind of blend together. Um, you know, I'll right around eight 30, I'll start 
going through, getting some online stuff, and hopefully they'll be there by 930. And if they're going on at 10, we'll have a, a chance to spend 10, 15 minutes together, 20 minutes, and get to know each other and get comfortable with everybody. And it, to me, it has really seemed to bring out the best in people. One, once we start, it gets it just kind of cuts away from a lot of the nerves, and it makes for a, a better conversation that seems to be more listenable. And it just strikes me as you're saying that, that that's a good time, too, for partners to say to the reporter what you can't talk about. Um, I had a lot of interviews in the last couple of years where we, I was doing an interview on an issue as PPG, and then some reporters would say, well, how do you think the mayoral race will affect that and which candidate this and which candidate that. And on PPG time, I legally cannot talk about that. 501c3s, we cannot weigh in on elections. So your reaction is fascinating because in the last couple of years, I learned like many media folks who've been in media for years don't know that. And it led to awkward moments in interviews because if it was live or being recorded, I would have to say, I'm part of a nonprofit organization and legally we're not allowed to weigh in on electoral politics and campaigns. I'm like, that's not a great thing to have on the air. It's just not interesting. So that could be a good moment to, to clarify things like that as well. Um, you know, we're talking about this issue today, but my organization only works on this part of it. I won't have anything to say on this other part, or either I'm not comfortable speaking about this, or I'm legally not allowed to speak about this. Um, if we do then, uh, politicians who hold a grudge can report us to the IRS and we can lose our tax exempt status. So that's the whole deal. Um, the tax exempt nonprofit status, no grudges at all. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so that could be a good moment to make those clarifications too. Um, and we do a different workshop friends on what advocacy 501c3s can and cannot do that what goes into all that too. Um, Anything else about con or I guess we wanted to know, yeah, how to how to be present. I'm yeah, I, I'm not you don't, to you work don't at your like I'm sitting right now. They want to sort of be set up straight and like I said, um, you know, project. Um, if you talk with your hands a lot, you don't want your hands to be all over the screen. That uh, you know, um, but also um, solid colors are good on TV. Um, like, I'm trying to think, I'm not great with women's fashion, but my mom has a shirt. It's really popular. It's like a design where there's like chains and all sorts of stuff going on and patterns. I don't know what that's, I don't know what that's called, but like, you want the person to be thinking about your message, not like, what the heck is she wearing? Or what the heck is he wearing? Like, and people... Because a pattern like yeah. this can like really, um, like your shirt, even did you wear that on TV? Yeah, I think you could. The uh, <laughs> you don't want green, um, so if you're if you're um, you'll never see a, a weather person wearing green, um, <laughs> and I think for you guys know why. I, so the, the, there's a green screen, um. This is only if you're doing like an in-studio interview, I, I would say that for out, out on the street, you can wear as much green as you want, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm describing this, the ugliest shirt in the world right now. I hope my mom doesn't doesn't listen to this. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, if you are if you are gonna be in studio, you, sh you should ask if it's going to be, there's a thing now called, um, we call it like a virtual set. So I remember on Channel 7, our 7 o'clock show, I don't even know if they still have that anymore. It used to be called The Now. But it, it had an anchor, and there were, like, desks behind them and stuff. And all the desks and stuff were, like, not really there. It was, like, this green screen. You could kind of tell. It looks a little fake, but, like... <laughs> um, and if you were being interviewed on that and you wore a shirt that matched, like this is the color that you don't want to wear, like this kind of green, we call it chroma key. It's, you, you would literally, it would look like you didn't have a body if you wore that shirt. It would, cause it would just blend into the background. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of rare that you're going to be doing that kind of interview. But if you're going to the station, like you might want to just make sure that it's okay, you know, to wear that. Um, I'm not really big on telling people, like we interviewed a, a UB student once um, and she had like really low cut, like shirt and like people said some things, but especially like 
I, I just I'm not comfortable like telling people you know what to like how they look like it's just exactly I'm not going to do that like there are some traditional rules as far as that goes but like it's just not my I don't feel comfortable doing that you know um, and I think uh for our partners it would also be think about I don't know how if this is if this is good or not but a lot of our partners like Seamus has a slow roll hoodie on partners will wear a large logo of their organization is that okay on camera or not, or do you prefer not Yes, if it's your organization, like it, that would be a perfect thing for Seamus to wear, but it wouldn't necessarily be a perfect thing for him to wear Bill's sweatshirt mm. because it's, if the story is not about the Bills, um, you want to be wearing like what you're wearing in your everyday environment. So just because you're going on TV doesn't necessarily mean you have to wear a dress or a suit or anything. It, um, as long as it's, you know, kind of representative of, of uh, you know, what you're doing. Um, it can look weird out of context. Uh, if like, I remember this is years ago, I, I saw some Congress person walking through the middle of the Iraq desert with like a three piece suit on and it just looked, ridiculous. it looked, yeah, it looked ridiculous, you know, and it was like, well, they're dressed up, but they're not really dressed in an appropriate, you know, thing. So just wear what you're, what you're comfortable with and what you would in your normal day of, mm. you know, doing your job. Um, to a certain extent, like there were a couple of guys who I loved interviewing that were like think tank guys where, you know, like I would just like, you know, want them not to have a shirt on that had like grease on it and stuff. Cause that like, you know, your credibility to a certain mm -hmm. level, like you don't have to look um, like you're some fashion model, but you also don't want to look like you just rolled out of bed either. Like that's greasy think tank people. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about your organs. I know. <laughs> Uh, very good. Well, I think we're winding down on our tip section. I want to just ask what we've been asking in these series a little bit. Is there anything that people do frequently, less frequently? Like what are the mistakes people make that mean you can't use their clip? You can't use their interview, anything people should really avoid, um, or it makes it harder to edit them into your story and use their soundbite. Um, and yeah. no, no F bombs good one and, yeah. and pauses are good like what can be awkward for the reporter is when they do need a, a 10 second soundbite and when the person has said something really well and but maybe because they're nervous or it's just the way they speak and they don't pause it can be a very abrupt cut um so when you're when you're done saying a sentence you can just you know like pause naturally like you would in any conversation um otherwise it's, it's hard to edit around that. Um, does it make a difference? It's just a quick question. Um, does it make a difference if uh, people stand or sit? Uh, you probably, um, I don't think it really makes a difference, but you're going to want to ask the photographer. Uh, even as a reporter, I, I don't have any idea what they should sit. They always ask me. I don't want to um, rock though. Rocking is bad. Like people, when they get nervous, tend to like go like this. And then when you're trying to edit it, you just have a person. Yeah, and that can be a habit. I I do that when I'm nervous and standing up and, and talking. You don't want to try to plant your feet in the ground. And but if it does run through in any way. Very good. And I think that point of pauses and speed is so important too. Um, that's when we often so, we just share among staff when one of us is going to go off to do an interview. I have said, and hopefully this is true, you know, you you probably can't talk slow enough, right? Like we all talk so quickly when we get going. Um, so uh, we we say like talk so slowly on radio or TV that it feels awkward to you. And that's probably the right speed. And I wonder, is that, do you think that's right? Or have, like, have you ever had a guest and you're like, they're talking so slow, speed up, or that just doesn't happen? <laughs> uh, I think there have been a couple that have talked a little too slowly, uh, but yeah, right. Slow down and probably the back to editing. There is uh percentage of the population when they're talking they finish their statements and then they say immediately go so 
state member too. So, and, and I, I think I've tried to edit on so more than any other word that I've ever come across. Or right, like at the end, they'll like they'll give the answer. Like if I, you know, the Niagara Falls mayor used to do that. Every single question is it right? Like like he's getting you, you know, like it, and like he was really smart and really well spoken. But it was just like like he's trying to get you to agree to it, and that's like another tick that you know um you don't necessarily uh and that's why i think practicing can be very useful so that's a good point charlie because we would like to see if anybody wants to practice and watch which yourself is right kind of yeah but we you want to watch yourself after you do your interview or you can put your voice recorder on i sometimes do this and listen to myself in the car after and i mean even the tv professionals that are on every day you know i would watch i always watched my on camera thing and i mean almost every time i would say you look stupid like why did i look like that or why did, you know it's normal no one's a perfect tv robot you know um yeah. so <laughs> yeah yeah some people are natural by but you even he had to had to work at it you know uh it really is it's, it's nothing you can't work on it took me about a year of being on tv to even really be comfortable to go on and talk naturally so if you feel like it's awkward, you're not alone. Um, it's just something that, you know, um, you will get used to, but I think watching yourself and, and, uh, practicing those things will only make you better. And I find it's so hard to go back and, and listen or watch your own clip as well. So it's good to do that for practice, but sometimes when I'm done with one, especially if I don't think it went that well, I'm just like, I can't even <laughs> listen to that. But, um, Yes. Winding down on the tip section. Any other questions about this? Yeah. What about the uh, looking at camera? Is that, uh... that is a good one. You, you typically do not want to look directly at the camera. You want to look at the reporter asking you the question. Um, and they don't always tell you that. So it's also okay at the starter, if you are just with the camera person, as you said, and no reporter has come, it's okay to say, where do you want me looking? Where should I be looking? Yeah, that's okay yeah. to say that. And there, the first question they're going to ask you is, can you say your name and spell it for me? Which is kind of just off-putting for people. And the reason for that is because, like I said before, the, the person that's choosing that video and the person that's writing like your name on the screen underneath you is most likely going to be a different person than is conducting the interview. It's going to be a producer. So that producer just may have this video and say, I don't know who this is. And so they can watch, they can always go to the beginning and say, okay, this is Mary Smith and this is how she spells her name. That That's the only reason. It's not because the person thinks you have, you know, a tough name or something, mm -hmm. or, you know, or, or like if, if you're like a quote unquote important person, some people get like offended if you ask that, like, you don't know who I am, you know, it's for that reason. It's because... <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, other questions about preparing, doing it, Mara. Okay. Yes. Um, I know this is broadcast. Um, say you wanted to at least have a little bit of the game accurate. Can you ask for that quote? Yeah. Can you ask for the quote um, that the reporter in print is going to use? I'm. You. I mean, you could ask for a similar thing here. My experience has been that they won't send you the quote in advance, but what do you think? You're, you're right. Typically not, um, just because you're sort of opening the door to people editing their quotes and stuff. Um, you could, but I think if it's just an, a genuine thing where you think you might have gotten something wrong, I think, you know, you don't want to ask for like every quote, but you could say like, I just want to make sure I said that right. I think I might have given you the wrong, you know, I mean, the reporter wants it to be accurate. They don't want to put something in that they don't want to, they don't want to misquote you. That's not going to help them either. So it depends on the situation, but um, like people sometimes ask for like a copy of the article, like that's typically not, mm -hmm. not done. Um, but yeah, if you think it like factually, there could be something, something wrong, then I think that's okay to do. Anybody else? Yeah, Seamus. I'm sort of related to a question you asked or just a point you made about 
being a 501c3 and how you couldn't answer a certain question. We'll offer a wholehearted endorsement of PPG's 501c3 advocacy. Uh, I don't know what you called it. Workshop. Yeah, it was um, outstanding. Um, so I actually have word back from Scott saying, and he just, I said, second time, like, any welcoming any insight as to what you want to talk about. And he gave me four, he didn't give questions. He just, but he made four points and that's really helpful. Right. Cause like Jeff Kelly said here a couple of weeks ago, I go in with six questions. So in the best way that you can sort of extract that information respectfully, that's why I asked like sort of ethically, cause we know this isn't a partnership, you're journalists, you know? Um, so sort of with that in mind, like there's legally some things that you just can't answer, but I had another experience earlier this year with, with that experience of sort of not screening questions is, is a bad way to put it, but just sort of finding out and, and uh, a TV reporter. So well, we want to talk about this, this, and this. And there was one point that was just completely irrelevant. And, and I was able to just say, well, that's irrelevant. Um, so I would, you know, I don't have anything to say about that because it's irrelevant to us. What if it happens on the spot? You're, you're live on air perhaps, or you're just, you're being recorded. And is there, what's a respectful way to dismiss a question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Or yeah. talk about how like sense. you might only get 10 seconds. And what right. sometimes happens is they ask a question that fits their agenda. In this case, it was, what is gas, gas, gas prices? In fact, that sounds lower. Nothing. But that's something that, that's something they wanted to talk about because that's part of the story. But I don't want my 10 seconds on air to be spent on yeah, that's something that's, that's relevant great. to our organization. Can I say that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that uh, some people do that actually have to with me they seem to have to answer that question a lot um but uh you know there's just you just try to be as diplomatic as you can you know i'm not you know and it's different like you said you only have 10 seconds on camera you know with uh, with us you're probably going to have a, a little different kind of scenario and we probably have already talked about time i keep coming back to that but you know, know how much time that you do in fact have um so but I, I also remember, I, I don't know why this just flashed in my head. I remember listening to a live radio interview. It was on a Super Bowl pre pregame uh, thing. And the, the guy asked him, oh, so, you know, you won the, uh, you know, the Heisman Trophy, you know, back in 1973. And the guy goes, no, you've got me confused with John Capaletti. I'm Gino Capaletti. I played in the 60s. I mean, he just had to say it because there's no other way to get around it. So sometimes you just have to correct the person and you got to take your lumps and actually if you're nice about it, you probably win favor with that reporter overall. Yeah. yeah, and you don't want to be like BSing it either, right? I mean, you want to be talking about stuff that you know the answer to. And it's I think it's okay to you don't want to just say, I don't know, you know, but but you you want to think of a way like um Jay's example was good, like, oh, that's a really good question, and then talk about um, you know whatever it's good to have a couple you know backup things in your mind uh things will pop into your head probably as you're doing the interview um you don't ever want like you want to talk about your points but you want to be able to kind of weave them in you don't want to like um get into a thing like a, a lot of like politicians do where it's like they just sort of like hijack the whole thing and like don't answer the question talk about what i want to talk about and like that doesn't come across very well i don't i don't think that's that's um you know endears you to to voters or whoever but um you know you can sort of gently give the idea that maybe it's not like the most relevant thing you don't want to be like that's a stupid question you know like <laughs> but, Okay, very good. So we've done a lot on before and during the interview, super quick on after the interview. Of course, we just advise partners if you have gotten this great media opportunity and you've been out there to make the most of it after the fact. So sharing it to your newsletter, putting it on your own social media. If it's a very particular advocacy issue, sending that to elected officials you've been meeting with um, who you're seeking to influence on it. Um, so all of that, I think we've talked a bit more in other workshops and we can revisit all that too. But 
we're down to our final minutes. We can end early if we, if, if folks, if we don't have enough, but I hope that everyone will want to practice. So what we were kind of imagining is we could have a few volunteers to do a little mock interview um, and put these two on the spot as well, because they can kind of take turns. You can tell us, what do you want to be interviewed about? We'll just do a couple of questions and, and you can practice giving those answers. Um, this can be either on an issue you're working on, on an advocacy topic, or we can pick if that's too much, that's all good too. And we can pick like, what's your favorite Thanksgiving dish you want to be sharing about, you know, because I think so much of this is really about presentation and speaking skills and yes, your content and your message is important, but it's also that other piece equally too. So I wonder if we have any volunteers. I think there are folks on zoom too. If anybody on zoom wants to do an interview, we can put you up on the screen. I know you probably all want to do it. Anybody in the room wants to practice doing an interview. Yay. <laughs> Let's hear it for Sarah. <laughs> okay, what topic? Because let's say you've had a very successful uh, press release. You've been contacted. We want to interview you about this topic. So, what topic do you want to talk about? Okay. So, I guess you have to interview without knowing any context of this. But... That happens sometimes. Though. Yeah. Okay. So this is good practice for you too as well. So um youth youth involvement in 4H in Buffalo. Who wants to take the interview? Okay, I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. So um let's this is a, a pretty um <laughs> that's right. That's right. She should be the reporter here. <laughs> um so can you say your name and spell it? Oh. For me? I can Sarah Jablonski, S-A-R-A-J-A-B-L-O-N-S-K-I. Okay, and what's your title? 4-H team leader for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Erie County. Do I have to spell that? Um, no. Okay, good. But you should maybe specify at some point whether there's a dash between the four and the H. There is. Okay, there is. I'm from Marilla, so I know. Oh, nice. <laughs> cool. Um, but, okay, so uh, tell me a little bit about what you guys do. So 4-H youth development, some might know, especially if you're from Marilla, is very focused on agriculture. But also in the city of Buffalo, we do offer 4-H programming for young people. And um, I'm focused on teen leadership around civic engagement. And so we have a number of initiatives that we are doing in Buffalo. And the goal is to really bring the opportunities of 4-H, which are about public speaking, youth leadership, life skills to young people in Buffalo. Okay, you're swiveling in your chair. Seriously, so you wanna, yeah. Yeah, you're like, like, the, it's like the, so obvious yeah, to everybody. Swivel. I had no idea. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, the swivel chair. Yeah. I don't usually I have don't a swivel chair. chair. Yeah. The edge. Um, okay, that was good. And then, like, so you might get a general question like that. Um, and wh wh why, uh, why is this important for kids in Buffalo? But why do they need to know about farming? Well, we do have food systems initiatives in the city of Buffalo with 4-H. But 4-H is not just about agriculture. 4-H is about supporting young people where they're at and why they should get involved. Well, it's going to help build their skill sets. Um, but I want them to understand. I want everyone to understand that we're not just trying to put something on young people. We're not saying you have to raise animals to be part of 4-H. We're trying to come to them and and bring out their own skills and build up their skills and connect them to opportunities. Um, the 4-H program connects young people to Cornell University. Uh, we have important field trips. Uh, how do I call They're not. I didn't want to just call them trips. Um, we have lots of opportunities for young people to be involved with, and we don't want anyone to be excluded. We want all youth in Erie County to have the opportunity to build their leadership skills in whatever areas um, that they're interested in and wh where our skills and where their interests meet. So do you have, that was a good answer. Um, so do you have any like examples you can give of students, uh, successful, I don't know if you call them graduates of Are you thinking of getting into it? Um, or some things you can point to. Uh, so our so our signature uh, 4 H after school program is called Youth Can Youth Community Action Network, and we've had a lot of success working at multiple schools, including Tapestry, Olmstead One Fifty Six, Global Concepts in Lackawanna, yeah, Lafayette, 
And that uh, program is about young people identifying issues in the community that are important to them and then developing projects to address those issues. So we've held two community and police speakouts, which PPG has partnered with us on as well as Open Buffalo and other partners. Um, so that was an example, you know, especially around all the police shootings were happening other places, the youth felt it was important to have a conversation with the police and invite the community to be part of that conversation. Uh, oh my God. Uh, so we're actually, we do have that program ongoing now. It's no longer at schools, um, but we're meeting at Say Yes on Jefferson Avenue. And we're recruiting right now for any teenager in Buffalo who wants to be involved. We're currently working on a project about restorative justice circles around the conversation of white supremacy, you know, a light topic. So if any young people want to be part of that conversation, they're welcome to join us. Maybe. Um... Uh, I might say like, oh, how did how did you like how did how did you get into this? How uh, how did you get? Were you into in 4-H when you were younger? And oh, uh, I was not in 4-H. No, I'm part of this. I I got involved in this job because um I didn't really know what the job description was. It kind of tripped me up, and I was like, well, this could be an opportunity to learn something new and maybe apply my own interests to the job. Uh, and I knew 4-H was about food. So I came to the job thinking that I would be working on gardening, you know, getting everybody involved in gardening. And then this opportunity came along to do this program called Youth Can, which is about asking young people what they want to do. And then I realized that I care much more about that than pushing my own agenda or like, because I love gardening. I want other people to garden. I love helping people see what their vision, um, bringing it to reality. So when the shooting on May 14th happened, we were talking about anti-racism um, and we were going to do a series of interviews about like school curriculum, different things like that. And now we wanted to shift to really respond to that incident. And so I love that ability to be able to adapt and pivot because I've done that in my own life and I'm blessed to have a job that I can do that, apply that there. Well, by the way, it, it, I really liked how you asked that question because it brought me to like really about your own experience. Yeah, you know, you're not just trying to remember like and yeah, and and the reporter is sort of trying to warm you up in that way and make you feel. And she thinks that there was the all with her and wants to follow up and everything. So I said no. Topical. So anything like a topical, like it's it's in the news. It's a it's a big like civic issue that maybe uh, they're interviewing you. And even if it's not, that may be they may say, Oh, well, oh, this is really relevant because yeah, that's interesting. I never had any idea for H had to do with anti-racism. Right. I thought it was just, you know, raising goats or whatever, you know. Like and the opposite yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did a really well. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, folks in the room, any feedback for Sarah? Well, I think one thing is now, at least, uh, we're very interested in a four H. Cool, cool. Oh, awesome. Great. That was successful. <laughs> Thanks. They um, fall. She has a She's going downhill and say this is worrisome. And now it's like, yes, that's the beauty of this test. What we need to do is to focus and slow. I don't know. It was very, she said, you know, not all. They said the reason we call you is share, um, you know, and Seamus, you remind me of blanking. People this was um, a terrifying thing. It would sometimes happen to me when I saw the thing counting down from like five to one when I'm about to go live and I'm like about to make a fool out of myself in front of thousands of people. But that happens. And what I used to do was keep 
and I'm allowed to know. Wonderful. Oh, well, nice. Even just, I found <laughs> when, when reading something, if I could remember the first couple words of what I wanted to say, like the rest just flows. But sometimes those, like that first sentence, you just sort of like blank, you get nervous and you can keep a little visual aid to like, not to look at like during the interview, but just right before to get yourself in, you know, in the, the mindset. Cause I don't, I don't know. Been, I've only been to like, you know, the two rooms. I don't even know if she has like a bar. One super tiny thing that I made a note of at the beginning. Cause I've done this in interviews is you answered the first question and said, um, 4-H, you know, since you're from Marilla is blah, blah, blah. And then they can't use that clip because you've said something that has nothing to do with the viewer. The viewer didn't see. And that often happens to me. We talked in our first media workshop that there's also this practice that's quite perplexing to us outside of TV that they'll come to your press conference and you have just given your whole speech to the cameras. And then they want to pull you to the side to do a headshot interview and you kind of have to repeat all your points, which is, feels very weird. Um, but we know what we, we talked to, you know, they have to do that because it was said they want something, maybe this, I don't know if this is what you think, Charlie, but Jeff Kelly said they want something different than all the other networks are going to show. So they don't just want to have the same picture and the exact same quote. And then also they want like the different view of just one person. Um, but anyway, in those interviews, especially, I found myself saying, well, as I just said, this and this, or the Bill Stadium should have these benefits because as John just said, da, 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 and, you know, the viewer did not hear what John just said. So I think that's one I've caught myself doing before too. And you can, you get a more natural, the other reason to do that, mm -hmm. pulling aside is it, you'll maybe get a more natural thing one-on-one -on -one as opposed to this, you know, with all of these, this gaggle of reporters and you're standing at a podium and it's just, it's naturally going to be more kind of stiff. Mm -hmm. And um, that's another reason that, that they might want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nothing you did wrong at the podium. It's not because you said something wrong. It's just we actually said yeah. this is probably against your desires for something more natural. But we said you should feel free to kind of repeat your thing again because I, I, a lot of us have felt like we have to say something really different because this same camera person just recorded our whole spiel. But then they may only use the second part, and then your main points are gone. So yeah, yeah. we said it's okay to like really repeat your main points. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Thank you, you know, so uh, another thing too, you might want it well, with press conferences. A lot of times there's politicians in the background. There's a few in particular that are like experts at sort of positioning themselves behind the person <laughs> that's talking so that they will be in the shot for some reason. Um, and during, yeah, dur <laughs> during an election time in the media, we are, we are um, on the lookout and trying not to, um, uh, like, let's say, let's say uh, there's a, a town council race and there's mm -hmm. two candidates. And because the mayor of whatever town is a Democrat, he's going to have that Democratic candidate behind him because gets his name out there. You want to like during election year, we want to, we want to avoid that unless it's like a story about mm -hmm. politics. So we want that mm -hmm. the mayor, whoever it is, we don't want to give free publicity to either candidate. <laughs> And so they might pull you off because of that. Uh, do we have another volunteer? Yes. Let's go down here. Yeah, take the hot seat here. I like this approach. <laughs> uh, what would you like to be interviewed about? What's your What's your interview about that you're trying to communicate? Well, I guess I would say. I guess I would say that um, um, I'd rather be interviewed by my organ about my organization rather than my dog who passed away two years ago, you know, but um, <laughs> that's basically it. Yes. Who's going to, who is, who I'll, I I'll talk do to? this one. I'll try okay. This. And sir, I my name is Jay. Jay. Uh, and your name is Steve, Steve. And what's your organization, Steve? Well, uh, the organization, uh, the formal name is the analytical psychology society of Western New York. I know you love that, but do we, actually. But we go th through a, a different name called Young Center Buffalo, J U N G, uh, and uh, okay, you thought that, didn't you? But you 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 were wrong. Um, <laughs> um, so Steve, how long have you been in, in the organization? 
Well, I've been, I've been in the organization probably about uh, three years, and I've been, uh, this is my second year as president. What drew you to the organization? I beg your pardon. What drew you to the organization? What well, of course, I was, I, I was asked by a friend to join because um, he knew I had a background in philosophy and in psychology, or rather in social work, and um, just felt that... Um, the, uh, the mission and the aims of the Young Center, which have to do with education and um, uh, deepening psychology and deepening the perspective of people on their lives and also in the culture, um, he felt I'd be a good fit. And so far it has worked out. Who, how many people are involved in the society? Well, we have a small board currently under 10 people. And uh, we have probably, you know, a mailing list of uh, like 400 people, but the formal membership is probably uh, 50 ish. And do you have regular meetings? We have uh, regular meetings. Obviously, a board has a meeting once a month, but uh, we provide um, programs and talks and lectures uh, that are open to the public, not just to the membership. And uh, in fact, uh, one coming up later this month, October 28th, we have a fantastic uh, program. It's called um, The Red Book Revealed. And if you don't know what The Red Book is, uh, I can tell you. Well, tell me all about The Red Book, or at least well, do so. I'll tell you a little bit because we've got a whole program on it. Now, The Red Book is actually, it's kind of a secret book that Carl, Dr. Carl Jung uh, put together um, in his uh, middle to later years. And uh, he obviously was a prolific writer, um, an analyst, you know, with clients. And uh, but he had a, um, a wide range of interest. Uh, he was a Swiss uh, citizen and obviously a contemporary of uh, Dr. Sigmund Freud and many others like that. Um, but the Red Book is, uh, is a result. Uh, it's not a book that was designed to be published. It was a result of his... Um, exploration into the unconscious. Uh, Freud and him uh, really discovered something called the unconscious. And uh, Freud, of course, made a big deal of it. And so did Jung, although in a different direction. And the, the, the book uh, has to do with uh, his explorations and his discoveries and the personages that he count encountered in this uh, kind of like this underworld. And, um, he, he made it into a book with beautiful and striking symbolic uh, pictures and mandalas and uh, with a text. And it's now we have a copy of this in our uh, library. And it's like, you know, it's a very, it's more, it's a bigger than a, than a tabletop book. It's pretty big. So Steve, you probably get a lot of questions from friends and such about no, this, but, but what would be the, the thing that people find most surprising when you tell them about, for example, Carl Jung's red book, what would be something that just all of a sudden, or more specifically, let's get into the unconscious. What would you, what surprises people when you tell them a little bit about the unconscious that they probably didn't know? Well, they probably didn't know that they have an unconscious. And, well, uh, and uh, now if we tell them that, then we'll try to educate them into, um, uh, how to be uh, more familiar with the depth in themselves. A model that we have is called um, um, education for the soul. And that really kind of uh, can, can capsulate uh, the essence of what we want to do. We want to educate people that our soul and our psyche is not something to be ignored or denied but our lives are made more richer with a relationship to our insides and our culture will benefit as well. Steve, thanks very much. Thank you very much for your time. One thing that, yeah, that was really great. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say one thing that just reminded me, uh, don't ever grab the microphone. Like I, for a TV interview, some people like when you're, they think you're like offering it to them, like take it, and then you're playing tug of war with the microphone. It, they'll never, unless they specifically say. They tip it to you. You're just supposed to talk yeah. into it. You're not supposed to tell them take it. And the, and the reason is because for the reporter to ask the question, they have to get it back. <laughs> you know, in this case, you know, it's different. But yeah, because, because for them to ask the question, they have to put it back.
it would be awkward to keep handing it back. So yeah, very yeah. good. So feedback for Steve on that interview. I thought it was good. And actually, I, I was thinking, boy, you're you're making it difficult for me because it really went off into a lot of areas. But th this would be the kind of conversation I would have before he came on the show. Mm. Right. So we can we can kind of start narrowing down terminologies. And I, so that, that was the one thing I thought about when we were talking. This would be the conversation I would want to have beforehand. And then I think we could go off and, and we'd have a great conversation. Okay. Yeah. That. Yeah. But that's something really not your fault. It's just, yeah. But back to time. How much time do we have? Um, I want to just say I noticed Steve wore NPR socks today. Oh, wow. I didn't notice that. <laughs> Did you do that? Oh it's on theme. It's on theme. But there it is. There it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for your membership. <laughs> um, I thought you did a good job at like pivoting those questions that were some of those were like personal questions, but you pivoted it back to the organization and the programs you offer, which I thought was great to to do that too. Like obviously you want us to answer personally, but you you were said, I got into it because of this, and we have these programs now, or and this is the mission of the organization. So that was good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, like both of you asked this question. It was my favorite question as an interviewer is you get you're getting to the heart. You ask them what inspires you, what led you, like what. And so that is an opportunity for you to express your passion. And you started to do that and you combined it with the mission of the organization. And that's just a plus. Mm. You combine your personal passion while getting your mission out. Mm. Yeah. So great. Great, Steve. Thank you. Okay, really quick. Cool. Yeah. I just want to say, like, cool GSA, whatever, like, yeah. Here, do you want to? Oh, ah, sorry. Pass that one around. Really quick, please. So majority leader people Stokes will be hosting a free LLC formation um, workshop It's going to be December 8th is it going to be at Northland training corridor It's going to be from 3 3 p.m. to 6 and we are in partnership with the Western New York Law Center so for people who have any questions you can give us a call at 716-897-9714. Okay. That was that was very quick. I'm just going to add one thing and just it kind of just follows up on a lot of the things, but since I wrote it down, um, don't obscure your power. You know, the thing I find in interviews and I really enjoy is, especially for agencies that are public advocacy, advocacy groups, is that the, at the core of it all, there's this great power. And when that comes out in an interview, it's it's the best. And it, whether it's for you know an organization or if it's a person. and so. Don't obscure it, live it, get it out there. Maybe the, be the best thing to say about it is find different ways of saying it, whether it's 10 seconds or 30 seconds or 90 seconds, have a way of, of saying it and don't be afraid to, to bring it out. And if you're trying to think of a way that you can boil down your thing into a soundbite, uh, think about how you would describe it to like a friend or, you know, your partner or somebody kind of an elevator speech type thing that's it's a little trick that i use to like think what's the headline of my story or what just you know think about how you describe it to somebody who's maybe not in that world and then that's that gets your brain going in the right direction wonderful well it's two o'clock so yes final word. i just wanted to add um steve really mentioned that um, the Red Book Revealed uh, presentation is going to be next Friday at Trinity Church. We have a room there uh, at 7 30. So students are five bucks. And um, it's a beautiful book and it's an archetypal um, expression of spirituality and psyche together. It's really brilliant. Thank you. I just Wonderful. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming and huge thanks to Jay and Charlie. I feel like I learned a lot. And so hopefully when the microphone or the camera is in front of you next time, you'll feel super confident from this. So thanks so much.